Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, and I'm your host, Mike Allen. You know, everybody can disagree about who's best at this or that, or who's more famous than somebody else, but there can be very little debate about the enduring stature of maybe Connecticut's most famous resident ever, actress Katherine Hepburn. Yeah, sure, other names have competed for that honor since her passing 20 years ago, but it's difficult to find a name with more legacy appeal from our states. Well, here to discuss her phenomenal career is the coordinator of the Catherine Hepburn Museum in Old Saybrook, Elise Maragliano. She's going to be along in just a moment and wait until you hear the knowledge that she has. This week's trivia question, Connecticut can thank its entire modern history on the fortunes of just one boat. What was its name? Stick around after the program because then you'll know the subject for next week's episode. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. Yale New Haven Hospital was the very first hospital in Connecticut. They opened their doors 200 years ago and later introduced the entire country to the use of penicillin and chemotherapy. Today, some of the brightest minds in medicine choose to work there, and it's the primary teaching hospital for the prestigious Yale School of Medicine. For more information, log on to ynhhs.org. That's ynhhs.org. Catherine Hepburn remains one of the most recognizable names in American society. In fact, her films remain popular around the world. The Connecticut native was known for her rather no-nonsense, tough, witty, even sometimes somewhat combative style. She was fiercely independent and very self-assured on the big screen. Well, our guest today says that she got those traits from her parents, the fierce independent drive coming more from her mother and her great sense of humor from her dad. Well, as you're going to hear, both parents were remarkable in their own rights. Now, focusing for a moment on Katherine Hepburn's mother, she was born into a very wealthy family in New York State. However, by the time she was just 14, both of her parents, Katherine Hepburn's grandparents, were dead. Her father from suicide, the mother several months later from stomach cancer. So Katherine Hepburn's mother had to be shipped off to her uncle to be raised and therefore didn't fully participate in the family fortune. But when she got to college age, her uncle wasn't necessarily inclined to let her go. After all, she was a female, and in those years, a woman going to college was not a foregone conclusion. But Catherine Hepburn's mother fought for the right to go, and she ended up at Bryn Mawr outside Philadelphia. And that's where Catherine Hepburn herself would go when it was her time to enter college. Her family grew up in Hartford at 201 Bloomfield Avenue, a house she owned and eventually donated to the University of Hartford, which is across the street. The other property that she owned outside Old Saybrook was at 49th Street in Manhattan, where she stayed when she was performing on Broadway. Hepburn's very first film was in 1932 at the age of 25, A Bill of Divorcements, and her last one was in 1994 at age 87 called One Christmas. Along the way, she won four Academy Awards for acting, and nobody has touched that record since. Our guest today, Elise Maragliano, is the coordinator of the Catherine Hepburn Museum in Hepburn's longtime adopted town of Old Saybrook. Elise, I am so excited to talk about Catherine Hepburn. When you talk about the most famous people in Connecticut history, She's got to be number one, number two. I, I can't think of anybody more famous, really, than her. She's just such an idol, such a movie star and, and everything else. And people know her because of the movie she was in, of course. And the great thing I love about doing this podcast is, and talking to people like you, is we're going to be able to get sort of under the hood and talk about what her life was like here in Connecticut as well, which people probably don't know those stories too well. So thanks for doing this. And let's start off talking about her family, uh, you know, the start for her in Hartford. Tell us a little bit about her family. I mean, her mom and dad, dad was a doctor, mom was kind of an activist, and uh, she had some siblings. What, what can you tell us about the early years of Catherine Hepburn's life? She was born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut. Her parents were pretty remarkable. 
as you said, her father was a doctor. He was the head of urology at Hartford Hospital. Both of her parents were activists, really. Her father was a, an early campaigner for educating people about venereal disease, which was not a polite topic in the 1910s and the 1920s. But as a urologist, he felt it was this very important uh, health issue that people didn't talk about. And her mother was from Corning, New York. She was actually one of the relatives of the Corning Glass family. And she was a suffragette. So she headed an organization in Connecticut for women's suffrage. She was also a very early campaigner for access to birth control for women. So she founded the organization that uh, eventually became Planned Parenthood with Margaret Sanger. Yeah, Catherine Hepburn had some pretty remarkable parents. And throughout her life, in any interview she gave, she always gave credit to her parents. And she said, I'm actually not that interesting. My parents, they were remarkable. She always downplayed her own remarkability. She said, I'm not remarkable. My parents were remarkable. And, and anything that I've achieved, I really owe to them, to this really strong foundation. And she did have a lot of siblings. So she had three brothers and two sisters. And she was very close with her family. So her sisters were really a lot younger by a decade or more. And so it was really her brothers that she grew up with. And she grew up a tomboy. And she was encouraged by her parents to go out and climb trees and play with her brothers and do all of the things that polite girls didn't do in the 1910s and the 1920s. Would you say, and we're going to just sort of jump ahead for a second into her movie career, which we'll revisit uh, later on, but would you say that this is sort of a foundation of some of the roles she played, being independent, feisty, a strong-headed woman, that which was, you know, she was born in 1907. Women weren't known for doing that in those years. Yeah, absolutely. I think she learned from her parents to have an opinion and to stick by it, you know, not to be swayed by the negative opinion of other people, but to really be true to yourself and to not let people walk over you. And so she, from early on, you know, would kind of got her into a little bit of trouble because she did voice her opinion. And sometimes people didn't like that so much. And I think that a lot of her roles did match her personality that way, for sure. I mean, it's kind of funny to watch her movies today in 2023 and see just how out there she was. I mean, it's just remarkable. And I think probably it turned a lot of heads in back in those days. Uh, she, of course, had the advantage of a privileged childhood in terms of finances. And she got to go to private school in West Hartford, then went to Bryn Mawr, which I guess was her mom's alma mater. So tell us about that. She did always say that she was very lucky and very fortunate. She recognized that fact. And she came from a well-off family. She didn't come from really uber-wealthy family. Even her mother, who was related to the Corning Glass family, her parents both died when she was young. And her mother, so Catherine Hepburn's grandmother, was very insistent that her daughter should get an education. And so Catherine Hepburn's mother really was responsible for raising her younger sisters and then insisted that they go to college. And she really fought against her uncle to have that right for her to be able to go to Bryn Mawr and for her sisters to go to Bryn Mawr. So when Catherine Hepburn was old enough to go to college, Bryn Mawr was where she was going to go. So let's connect the dots here and talk about the iconic family home in Old Saybrook. So down Route 9, which kind of parallels the Connecticut River, and this house, for anybody who's never been to Fenwick Island, the section of Old Saybrook that kind of juts out into Long Island Sound right at the mouth of the Connecticut River, I don't know any other word for it but gorgeous or stunning. It's just beautiful there, and their house was right there. When did they move in? When did she take possession of the house? What can you tell us about that? They maintained residences in Hartford, so her parents bought the Fenwick home in 1911 or 1912. So when she was about five and a half years old or so, Fenwick was all summer homes for 
basically society folks from Hartford. And so that was their summer home. They would come down and spend summers there. You know, dad would go back up to the hospital in Hartford, but the kids and the mother would stay there. And so she spent summers in Fenwick throughout growing up through the teens and into the 20s. The one home that they lived in Hartford for probably the longest period of time is on Bloomfield Avenue. It's right across from the entrance to University of Hartford. And that was the Hepburn Hartford home until Thomas Hepburn passed away in the early 60s, 1962 maybe. And then Catherine Hepburn donated it to the University of Hartford. So they maintained a a Hartford home and really Fenwick was the place that they went for fun because you could swim in the Long Island Sound, you could play golf, you could play tennis, you could ride your bike, you could do all of the things that Catherine Hepburn loved to do. But she really called Fenwick her paradise. And that was where she would go to throughout her life. Whenever she wasn't on the stage in New York, she would go from her home in New York up to Old Saybrook for the weekend. If she was in Hollywood and not filming anything, she would come back and she would stay in Fenwick. She never purchased a home in Hollywood. She didn't consider that to be her home at all. She only rented when she was in Hollywood and she owned a house in New York and then the house in Fenwick. Let's turn to 1938 the new england hurricane and some call it still the long island express because it moves so quickly came into connecticut and just devastated the old saybrook house what can you tell us about that chapter yeah so in september of 1938 there was a massive hurricane that destroyed all along the shoreline in connecticut in rhode island Catherine hepburn was home in Fenwick at the time. This was 1938. 1938 is the year of the box office poison letter, which is her career had taken a nosedive and she had been labeled box office poison in Hollywood. And so she bought out the remainder of her RKO contract so that she didn't have to do the B films that the studio was trying to put her in. She came back east to try to recoup and figure out what to do next with her career. Of course, she ended up starring in the Philadelphia story on Broadway and was a huge hit. And then it became a film and her career resurrected itself. Uh, But she's back in Fenwick in 1938 and is hanging out in Fenwick the morning of the hurricane. And this is before you have any warning systems. There's no tracking of hurricanes truly the tracking was done basically by reports that people were getting from ships that were out in the waters so they didn't know that a hurricane was on the way she was there with her mother her brother a family friend some of the people who worked for the Hepburns their cook and she talks about it in her autobiography she says in the morning she got up and went swimming in the Long Island Sound like she does every morning then she went out and played golf She claimed she got a hole in one. And then her and her friend came back at lunch and started playing in the waves again because it was really fun. The waves were big. And then eventually they were like, these waves are actually getting really big. It's getting really pretty stormy out here. We should probably go inside. So they went inside and the storm just worsened and worsened. And so they tried to convince their mom that they needed to leave. Like, mom, I think we need to go. And the mom was sure that the house was solid, it was all fine, they would be okay. And then there was an attachment to the back of the house that was where the laundry was, and that attachment was broken free from the house because the waves were so intense at that point. And they thought, okay, now we really need to go. But at that point, the waves were so high, they couldn't go out the front door. They had to climb out a window Her brother Dick tied a rope around his waist so they could all hold on to it and stay in a line and not get swept away by the current. And they got away from the house to higher ground. And she says about 15 minutes later, the whole house just got picked up off of its foundation and swept out into the Long Island Sound. So they were very lucky to escape that. In our museum, we have the bathtub from the original house because when they came back the next day there was nothing left of the house except for some debris and then a bathtub and a toilet that were just 
still right in place. So we have also a picture of her sitting on the toilet next to the bathtub pretending to read a magazine, which I think tells you a lot about her sense of humor, that this obviously must have been a fairly traumatic experience to have to escape out the window of your house and have your whole house destroyed. But, you know, she's able to kind of laugh about it the next day. And I think that sense of humor probably came in large part from her father, because in her autobiography, Me, she tells the story of, you know, escaping out of the house. And then she goes to find a phone so she can call her father, who's up in Hartford, and tell him, that they're all okay. So she gets them on the phone. She says, mom's okay. I'm okay. But the house, the house is gone. It just got swept away. And her father's response is, well, I hope you had the sense to throw a match on it first because I'm covered for fire, but I'm not covered for being swept away. (laughs) I love that. Absolutely great. I heard a story somewhere about this incident where there's a maybe a photo of Katherine Hepburn digging in the sand on the beach for the parents' silverware? Yes, we have that photo in the museum as well. And she does write about that in her autobiography. So when they went back, there was really sort of nothing around. She noticed there was stuff in the dirt. And so she dug through the dirt and found a good portion of her mother's silver. And there is a photo of her doing that. At that point, she had saved a significant amount of money from the films that she had done. So she was really instrumental in rebuilding the home. She helped pay for it. The way the home looks now from the outside is really pretty much how they rebuilt it. So they did rebuild it significantly larger and raised it off the ground so that it would be a little bit more protected from future flooding. So let's go back five years before this storm And this is when she won her first Oscar for the movie Morning Glory. And I think, just quickly so people know, she didn't actually start acting until her senior year in college at Bryn Mawr, where she was in a student play, and then was just a hit in Hollywood to get the Morning Glory assignment, and then had a couple of movies after that. But then fill us in what happened with the Poison box office letter. Sure. So she did start acting in college and then went to New York after that, worked in theater until 1932. She went out and did her first film. And then she did within about 18 months, did six films. This is the studio system where they paid you on a weekly basis and put you in as many films as they possibly could. So her first film, A Bill of Divorcement, was a huge hit. She became an instant star because she was so different and so unusual. And then Morning Glory, she won her first Oscar. After Morning Glory, Little Women was a huge hit. And then she had a series of films that didn't do very well. In 1938, this gentleman, Harry Brandt, who was the head of an organization of movie theater owners, published a letter that was like an open letter to Hollywood studios saying that The studio system paid these exorbitant salaries to stars and then put them in these movies, but the public didn't want to see these stars. And they just are making these movie theaters carry these movies that nobody wants to see. He lists a number of different actors and actresses. When he talks about Katherine Hepburn, what he actually says is that Katherine Hepburn, who just turned in wonderful performances, her pictures still flop. And then later in the letter, he mentions Marlena Dietrich and says that she, too, is poison at the box office. That's where that phrase ends up coming from. After this letter, all those stars that he mentioned became known as box office poison. She couldn't really get a job after that. And some of the films that came from this box office poison era are pretty much classics now, like Bringing Up Baby or Stage Door. As I said, she came back east. She had a friend who was a playwright, Philip Berry. He was also in a little bit of a career slump. And so he came to Fenwick and said, I have some ideas for plays. And they hit on the Philadelphia story. And that was her big comeback as well as his. Now, this was about the time that her six-year-long marriage 
to uh, Ludlow Ogden Smith ended, right? So she marries him coming out of college in, I guess, 1928 or thereabouts. And right about the time that all this is happening with that poison box office letter, she divorces him. And was it because she had met Spencer Tracy at this point in time, or did that come later? No, she did marry Luddy, as he was called, in 1928. He moved his business, took her to New York so she could pursue her acting career. He actually changed his name legally because she did not want to be Catherine Smith. She didn't think that that sounded very exotic. There was also already Kate Smith, and she didn't want to be confused with Kate Smith, although I'm sure she wouldn't have been. So he did change his name legally to S. Ogden Ludlow, and that remained his legal name the rest of his life. But when she moved out to Hollywood in 1932... She left him behind in New York, and she says in her autobiography that that was really the beginning of the end of their marriage. She, in 1934, went down to Mexico and got a quickie divorce in Cancun. So really, by 34, their marriage was over, although they remained really good friends. Her family absolutely loved Luddy, and so anytime she was in Connecticut, He was in Connecticut, too, hanging out in Fenwick. She had a relationship with Howard Hughes for a number of years in the late 30s. That relationship was really kind of in between Luddy and then Spencer Tracy. She didn't really meet Spencer Tracy until they did Woman of the Year together, which came out in 1942. And that was the beginning of their relationship. So now this was a ongoing romance between Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy. And while she had gone to Cancun to get her divorce, Spencer Tracy was not able to get a divorce, was he? I can't say why Spencer Tracy never got a divorce. He was Catholic. His wife was Catholic. It was not really an accepted thing at the time. What Catherine Hepburn always says is that she didn't want to marry Spencer Tracy, that she was fine with whatever relationship he had with his family and that the last thing that she wanted was to get married again. She always said that she didn't think she made a very good wife and she wasn't interested in being one. She talked relatively limitedly about her relationship with Spencer Tracy. You know, there's been lots of books written about them. I can't truly say why they never got married, except that she says she didn't really want to. Interesting. Now, Considering that she still holds the record for the most number of Oscars earned by any actor or actress, it's remarkable to me that the length of time between her first and second Oscar was 35 years. So she didn't win her second one until 1968 when she co-starred with Spencer Tracy in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And that must, she was 61 years old when that movie came out. I mean, that's amazing. And then the following year, she gets The Lion in Winter. That's her third Oscar. And I guess the whole idea of being poisoned at the box office kind of turned around. Yes, I think that stretch between acting wins is also a record. It might have been broken a year or so ago by Judd Hirsch, but it is a remarkable gap. She was nominated in between there several times. She was nominated 12 times overall. In between there, she was nominated for Philadelphia Story, for African Queen, for Summertime, for Rainmaker, for Long Day's Journey Into Night, for Suddenly Last Summer. She was constantly being nominated in between those two wins from 34 and 68. But, you know, she was always being He's kind of beat out by somebody else. I remember at the time her refusal or lack of desire to come to the Oscar presentation to pick up the awards was something that people talked about and some were downright offended that she behaved that way. Others were thinking more that this just showed her independence. How do you characterize that portion of her behavior? So it's interesting because she has said different things about that over the course of her life. For a while, she said things like, I don't believe in prizes. My work is my prize. 
And then kind of later in her life, starting in the 1970s, she started saying, well, you know, I think I don't go because I'm afraid I'm going to lose. She just didn't want to have to sit there and then lose. And she was very competitive. You know, she wants to win. You know, it wasn't like a Marlon Brando kind of stand against the principle of Oscars. She probably wasn't very good at also sitting through like a three-hour ceremony. She had a lot of nervous energy and frenetic energy. So I don't think she was comfortable, you know, showing up. It's not really her scene either. Even in the 1930s, she didn't like going to big parties. She didn't really like the kind of red carpet scene. When I look at this entire body of work of Katharine Hepburn, another standout portion of this is that she wins her first Oscar for Morning Glory when she's 26 years old, and she wins her last Oscar when she's 75 years old in 1982 for the movie On Golden Pond. That's remarkable. She had a remarkably long career, 64 years was in a remarkable number of films, and she constantly went back to the stage throughout her life. She performed on stage every single decade. In the museum, we have a couple cases that are dedicated just to her career. And, you know, I always call it the earlier career and the later career. And then I laugh because I say the later career covers 1950 through 1994, which is longer than most people's careers in general, not just the second half of it. Exactly. It's amazing that at age 87, she made her final film called One Christmas. So now she's in her 90s. She's proven everything she needs to prove to herself and to anybody else who was was watching. And she is living in her wonderful home in Old Saybrook. And at the age of 96 in 2003, she finally passes away. What can you tell us about that? So she officially retired to Old Saybrook in 1997 and stayed in her home in Fenwick. She did pass away in the home in Fenwick. It was massive news that, you know, there were news helicopters taking footage of the home. The police came and kind of shut down the streets around there so that you weren't getting reporters or curious people trying to sort of, you know, come in and come into the house or things like that. My understanding is it was a bit of a press zoo at the time because it was such major news. Wow. Let's uh, finish this with a question about the museum. What will people learn coming to the museum? There's information in there about her family and her time in Old Saybrook. And then we have another section of the museum that really focuses on her career. And we have things like the earliest surviving actor's equity contract from a play called Art and Mrs. Bottle from 1930, which is one of my favorite artifacts because it has a great story behind it, which is that she had negotiated this salary for performing in this play. And she was very proud of herself. She had negotiated up to $125 a week. And then she had some altercations with the director. The director fired her. And then they tried to find a replacement for her and couldn't find a replacement. So they came back to her and said, well, will you come back to the production? And she said, yes, I will. But now you have to pay me $150 a week because you hurt my feelings. So we have that contract with $150 on it, which is wonderful. We have a pair of boots from the African Queen on display. And then we also have our rotating exhibits. Our new exhibit is called Cover Girl Kate. So it's magazine covers that cover eight decades from the 1930s to the 2000s. And you can sort of get new insight into Catherine Hepburn, but also into the history of 20th century America, really, because her career was so long, it really spanned most of the 20th century. So for example, those magazine covers I'm talking about, she was on the cover of magazines And inside there's articles about Catherine Hepburn and you flip over the page and in the 1930s, there's articles about the Great Depression. And then you have articles about World War II. You have articles about 
McCarthy, whether or not women should be in the workforce, the emerging AIDS crisis about the first Harry Potter films. I mean, really her career and her life spanned this huge period of time in the 20th century where American culture itself uh, underwent really dramatic change. When Catherine Hepburn died, she was returned to her hometown of Hartford, where she was buried in the Hepburn family plot in Hartford's infamous Cedar Hill Cemetery. That wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path. You really have to get to Old Saybrook to see the Catherine Hepburn Museum. And after you take in the exhibits there, drive down to Fenwick Island, not far, about two miles, and see her former home at the beautiful spot where the Connecticut River enters Long Island Sound. I want to thank our guest for today's program. She's Elise Maragliano, and she is the coordinator of that Catherine Hepburn Museum. The answer to this week's trivia question, the question was, Connecticut can thank its entire modern history on the fortunes of just one boat. What was its name? Yes, the answer is the Mayflower. Did you know that Connecticut's first settlement was established by persons coming from the Plymouth Plantation, which is where the Mayflower landed? Well, we're going to have some seriously eye-opening stories about that Mayflower voyage for you next week. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Please be safe and stay healthy. 